Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly at 3 p.m. For those of you who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on the bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website and we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk titled The Do's and Don'ts of Retrenchment. My name is Wong Chien. I'm an associate with Mao and Coin Associates and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Now, before we begin today's talk, let me introduce the firm and what we do. Mao and Coin Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Datuk Mao and Coin. Our ABLE team today comprises of 23 lawyers and a support team of 19. Datuk Ma is now a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primar primarily with the SMEs, family businesses, as well as individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, dispute resolution department, including litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, dedicated employment industrial relations team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. So today's talk is part of our MWK online talk series. By way of a background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. But, be, but with the COVID-19 MCO, we have moved online in order to continue with our objectives of sharing knowledge, raising awareness and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and as well as in-house counsel. This is our 17th talk in 2021 for our online talk series, which has been attended by some 3,000 attendees. Today, we are expecting about 156 people who have registered. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute legal advice. In the event you require legal advice to your matter, please contact us for complimentary legal consultation. Details will be given at the end of this talk. Now, let, uh, we have two speakers today, uh, Ms. Jasmine Wong and Mr. Navin Joshua. Jasmine will be speaking first, followed by Navin, and we will then conclude the session with a Q&A session. Allow me to introduce you to our first speaker for today, 
uh, Ms. Jasmine. Jasmine is an associate in our dispute resolution, employment, law, industrial relations, and individuals and family, families departments. Her areas of practice include laws of citizenship, adoption, employment, medical, and personal injury. And she regularly provides advice to clients on various employment issues, represent clients in unfair dismissal claims. Our second speaker today is Mr. Navin Joshua. He has been admitted to Malaysian Bar in 2017. He's an associate in our dispute resolution, employment and industrial relations, and individuals and family department team. His areas of practice include the laws on employment and industrial relations, advisory and litigation matters, as well as general litigation, which includes contractual disputes and debt recovery. Now, our speakers will target to complete their presentation by 3.45 p.m. So if you have any questions, Please post your questions that you would like to ask in the Q&A se section at the Q&A box below. You may also like or upvote the questions that you would like to you would like or questions that are similar to what you want to ask and the most liked answers or uh, sorry the most liked questions or most popular questions will then be discussed and answered by our speakers later during the Q&A session. We do anticipate many questions on this topic so we appreciate that uh, you confine your questions to the topic and the talk points that our speakers will cover today. Now let's move on to the talk points that our speakers will cover today. Today's talk points, there are four talk points here. The first is understanding retrenchment. And the second is retrenchment says done properly. This will be covered by Jasmine, our first speaker today. And Navin will be covering the third and fourth point, which are process flaws resulting in unfair dismissal. And lastly, the court's approach to retrenchment. I'll now hand over the virtual floor to Jasmine. Jasmine, over to you. Thank you very much, chi -En, for that kind introduction. And thank you to all of you who have decided to spend your midweek afternoon here with us. Now, our talk today will focus on retrenchment, which um, is not a foreign concept to us uh, recently. Now, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen and heard of various businesses, such as the airlines, um, and hotel and tourism industry undertaking retrenchment exercise. So what is retrenchment? Retrenchment is a form of dismissal that is justified on the basis that the employer's role has become redundant. Therefore, there must be a discharge of surplus labor and proof of redundancy, which will be the surplus of labor, is required for a retrenchment exercise to be valid. So you can see redundancy or surplus of labor can arise as a result of various reasons, which include economic downturn, merger of certain departments or work units, closure of business, introduction of technology, cessation of job functions, or for example, less people are required for a job. Now, if you put it in another way, redundancy is a situation where the employee or the position or rather the services is no longer required. And retrenchment is the action taken to terminate this particular employment relationship in the event of redundancy. In the case of Aluminium Company of Malaysia, Berhad against Jaspal Singh, the court explained the law of redundancy, which says that it is the services of the employee which must be made redundant and not his position or title. So an example would be cashier or travel agents. For cashier, we nowadays we have seen supermarkets which introduce um, self-service counters. So you do not uh, require cashier any longer. And the same goes for travel agents as well. We can nowadays look up uh, various online, Trivago for example, and we do not require the services of travel agents. And in these particular situations, it is possible for cashier and travel agents to be made redundant. Now, in the case of R.J. Singh Gurbachan against Hexagon, the court say that mere evidence of reorganization which led to the employee's redundancy is insufficient. The court, uh, or rather the employer, will need to show why a department was shut down under a reorganization exercise. So all proof and evidence must be shown that the employee's job functions must have ceased or reduced and that it must have been made redundant. And all of this falls back to the employer's prerogative to reorganize the business, for example. Cooperative Perumahan Angkatan Tentera says that the retrenchment of an employee can be justified if it is carried out for profitability, economy or convenience of the business. And the services may become surplus if there was reduction, diminution, or cessation of the type of work that the employee was performing. At the end of the day, regardless of what the employer has 
has decided, the employer will need to show proof in court if this is contested subsequently by the employee. The case of Bayer says that the burden of proof is on the employer to prove redundancy. And we show, rather the employer must show that redundancy was consequential upon the actual surplus of workforce. And to satisfy this burden of proof, the employer may need to um, adduce evidence such as the financial records or audit reports to show that the company was in fact suffering from a decline in business, which resulted from an economic meltdown. And if the employee was successful to show any contrary evidence, such as the hiring of new employees or opening of new branches or outlets, this will negate the employer's position that there was in fact redundancy, which led to the retrenchment. So what are the principles of retrenchment in general? The employee is entitled to organize his business in the manner he considers best. This is recognized by the court. And as long as the decision was made bona fide in good faith, the decision would be immune from um, examination even by the industrial court. And whether or not the uh, retrenchment exercise in the particular case is made in good faith or not is a question of fact and degree depending on the particular um, circumstances of the case. And at the end of the day, the industrial court has the power and they are indeed duty-bound to investigate these respective facts and circumstances of the case to determine whether or not the employee, employee was made redundant and whether or not the employee was retrenched in accordance with the due process. So retrenchments are challenging and it can definitely affect good employer and employee relationships. And that is why it is always a last resort. Employers would usually resort to various cost-cutting measures to avoid undergoing a retrenchment exercise. Cost-cutting measures would, involve, would include uh, reducing or limiting working hours or overtime by the employees, restricting new recruitment of employees, or stopping seizing all private events. And this would be the company dinners, annual trips, any private events that are usually organized by the company. The company may also consider freezing bonuses and increment of salaries, offer early retirements, or even considering the reduction of salary and temporary layoff. But this is something which we must emphasize that salary, and re salary reduction and temporary layoff must be done with consent of the employee. Another option which is rather common for employers to consider is to offer voluntary scheme separation or mutual scheme separation as well. Now, in the case of Pinas Realty, the court took cognizance of the economic downturn in the year 1997. And as a result of this economic downturn, the construction industry was badly affected. And the, uh, and the employer's decision to reduce the employee salaries was deemed in good faith and justified because of the financial situation. The court also looked at the situation as a win-win situation for both the employees and employers because the employer could have avoided the situation of retrenching the employees or dismissing them. Now, in this case of Lim Chi Wan, the company uh, resorted to withdraw benefits which were given to the employees. And although this would be peculiar on the facts itself, but then the principles would be the same because the company withdraw the benefit of providing a company car to the claimant, to the employee. And in reviewing the terms of the appointment letter and the employment contract, the court took the position that this company, the provision of the company car was actually a privilege and not a right which the employee was entitled to in the first place. And because it is a privilege and not a right, the employee could not complain if it was subsequently withdrawn by the employer. Now, in the event if the employer has no choice but to resort to retrenchment, what should the employer do? So the over overview of retrenchment process would be, first of all, the employer will need to establish genuine redundancy. And second, if the employees are represented by uh, unions or any representative, the employer would be required to consult them. And before before retrenching or commencing the retrenchment exercise, the employer can consider terminating foreign employees first. And this is actually provided for in the Employment Act, Section 60N. Apart from all of this, the employer would be, it would be good if the employer can observe the guidelines in the Code of Conduct for Industrial Harmony. And in the process of selecting employees, consider and exercise the principle of last in, first out. And at the end, once you have commenced, or rather before you commence the retrenchment exercise, employer would need to submit 
the statutory PK form to the nearest Department of Labour. This notification retrenchment form must be submitted to the Labour Office and if the employer fails to do so, there may be a penalty of fine of 10,000 ringgit. In this particular PK form, employers would be required to disclose information such as um, reasons for the retrenchment, number of workforce, number of workers involved in the particular uh, retrenchment exercise. Now, when we're talking about the last in first out principle, this is particularly used in the selection of employees to be retrenched. And the general rule is that the employees cannot randomly select who to retrench just because the employer does not um, see eye to eye with the particular employee that does not provide grounds for the retrenchment. And the last and first out principle says that the employees with the least number of years uh, of service in a particular category will be chosen to be retrenched. Several exceptions to this uh, last in first out principle would be if the employer has an alternative objection, uh, objective selection criteria, and this can be justified and, and justified in court if it is contested, or if the employee has a special or additional skills. LIFO will not also be used if there is only one employee in a specific work category. And another case is that if the employee has poor disciplinary record, the employee may be selected to be retrenched as well because the industrial court take the position that uh, the employer has the prerogative to ensure there is a disciplined workforce um, in ensuring industrial safety and high productivity. So um, this is a case where the employee was the only one, uh, the only project manager in his company and the employee with whom was retrenched, he alleged that the company has actually breached the principle of last in first out. But upon evaluating the organization chart and his services in the, co uh, in the company, the court held that because this employee was the one and only assistant project manager and that the employer has no further, required, further needs of his services, the employer was justified in departing from the last in first out principle. So earlier, we have mentioned about the Code of Conduct for Industrial Harmony as well. This was drafted and aimed to promote fair and systematic practice. It sets out various principles and guidelines for the employers and even court to, to base on and consider as well. And the main aim is to achieve greater industrial harmony. We will see that the industrial court usually and more often than not refer to this code of conduct in considering and determining whether or not the employer's actions in commencing a retrenchment exercise was reasonable. So I have actually uh, selected a few of the articles concerning retrenchment in this slide, which in this slide we can see article 20, which talk about uh, in the situation of redundancy, the employer must consult the employer's representatives and trade unions and must take various positive steps to avoid or minimize reductions of workforce by using these appropriate measures such as uh, limiting the recruitment, reducing the number of working hours and overtime, which we have seen earlier, and also consider retraining or transferring an employee to another department. And if retrenchment becomes necessary, even though the employer have already taken the appropriate measures, Article 22 sub A says that the employer should take the following measures, such as giving as early as possible a warning to the work to the employee's concern. They may be retrenched. Employers should also retire workers who are beyond their normal retire, retiring age, which should be 60 uh, as the minimum retirement age in Malaysia. Employers can also um, spread the termination over a longer period of time as opposed to retrenching um, a large group of people at one time and ensuring that no such announcement is made for the employees or their representatives and trade unions have already been informed. The employer should also select employees to be retrenched in accordance with the objective criteria Criteria. And this is stated in Article 22 Sub B, which we have also already seen earlier in the earlier slides. Um, the employer should select based on the employee's ability, experience, skill and occupational qualifications required by the particular company. Uh, consider as well the length of service and status. So this will include whether or not the employee is a non-citizen, is a casual employee, temporary employee or permanent employee, the age of the employee, family situation, various kind of factors. And as long as the employee, uh, sorry, 
as long as the employer is able to justify the selection criteria, this would usually hold up in court. And based on these articles in the Code of Conduct, now it is clear that the communication is an important aspect in the retrenchment exercise. If a retrenchment exercise is done right, there are usually lesser chances of an employee filing an unfair dismissal claim in the industry. Court. And in fact, we have also seen various instances where the retrenched employees return to the company if they were given the chance or opportunity to. So the Code of Conduct also provides for these retrenched employees to be given a priority for engagement or re-engagement. Now, the question which we usually get is whether or not the employer will be penalized for not complying with the Code of Conduct. Under the Industry Relations Act, Section 30, Sub 5A, the industrial court may take into consideration any agreement or code relating to employment practices. So this means that the court is able to refer and uh, base their decision on the code of conduct. But in the case of Equal Integration Services, Sundrian Berhad, the court took the position that this code of conduct is a mere guideline and failure to follow the guidelines in the code of conduct cannot cannot vitiate the fact that there was actually a genuine redundancy in the company. So under the Employment Act, sorry, um, I understand that you cannot see my slide. Is it good not here? Now, under the Employment Termination and Layoff Benefits Regulations um, 1990, this is only applicable to the Employment Act employees whose salary is actually below than 2,000 ringgit. And under these regulations, uh, employees are actually entitled to uh, certain termination benefits. And the question is that if an employee accepted a retrenchment benefit, does it prevent the employee from filing an unfair dismissal claim? So in the case of uh, Fong Yuk Hyung against LH Technology, the court says that such a doctrine of estoppel does not apply to the process of industrial adjudication. And the acceptance of the retrenchment benefits by the employee will not prevent the employee from filing an unfair dismissal claim. And this is as stated in the case of Nadaraja. So um, a common question which we always receive from the, from the employees as well is that it is it's in respect to this particular issue because they are of the opinion that once they have accepted the termination benefits, they will not be able to file uh, the unfair dismissal claim in the industrial court. But that is not the case. And with that, I will um, pass the floor on to Navin who will continue on with the course approach to retrenchment and fair labour practice. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tian, for the kind introduction. And also thank you, Jasmine, for giving a proper explanation with regards to the retrenchment process. Today, from, as for my session, we will be looking at the retrenchment cases decided by the industrial court to look at the court's approach to retrenchment and also to see what tantamounts to fair labour practices. That is what separates a good retrenchment exercise and an invalid one. For the first case that we will be looking at, it will be the case of Nora Hayati Binti Sulaiman against Usma Engineering. In this particular case, the employer in this case did not take any measure to minimize the reduction in workforce. And there was also no evidence of consultation with the employees. When we talk about consultation, the learned chairman had also proceeded to include the articles from the Code of Conduct in the judgment, whereby in paragraph 36 of the award, the learned chairman herself had stated that, be that as it may, the accepted practice would be as per the guidelines in articles 21 and 22 of the Code of Conduct. The reason why we're going through this particular article, especially article 21, when we talk about consultation, the employees understand, I mean, even the law is uh, very understandable that the ultimate responsibility for a decision on any size of workforce rests with the employer. But all that is being asked of the employer is to have some sort of consultation or a dialogue session just, just to have it out with the workers to see what they can do or even their trade unions to see how they can negotiate on behalf of their employees. Article 22A, as in explained by Jasmine earlier, I just want to touch on a few points here whereby giving early warning to the affected employees and also introducing some schemes such as voluntary separation schemes and also mutual separation schemes. These are all important in order for the employee to actually understand what is going on because when the employees are actually informed of a sudden retrenchment exercise without any particular warning, they tend to go into a shock and they do not know what to do and they just sign whatever that is before them, even if it is unfair towards them. 
So uh, an early warning in the form of any consultation would be very, very benefic beneficial towards the workers. And also on the second part, uh, one particular point, which is to allow the termination to take place over a period of time. This is not only beneficial for the employees, but also for the employer in the sense that you're allowing the worker to, to commit a proper handover and so that the works would not be jeopardized by any lack of manpower and some sort of thing. Because at the same time, the employee is also going to be allowed to have a monthly salary and a cash flow for them to look after not only themselves but also their family. Article 22B, as you can see, it was also explained uh, properly and thoroughly by Jasmine earlier. But the one part which is LIFO, which includes consideration of the length of service, this is uh, in particular very important. Whereby some employees have been have been uh, looked away and not even given any chance to continue their service, despite being in service for a long time to give priority towards uh, junior employees, which is definitely unfair considering the amount of hard work that they have been putting towards the company. Therefore, the court in paragraph 88 of that particular case had also said that the company's non-compliance to articles 20, 21 and 22 of the Code of Conduct without offering any explanation is nothing short of unreasonable conduct. What is important here is that the courts are not saying that you can commit this non-compliance uh, and you will definitely be punished. It's not like that. It's just that the court is saying that you can not comply with these articles, but all they need is a proper and justified explanation to show that the livelihood of the employee was ended in a proper way with a very justifiable reason. The company in this case had failed to provide any evidence that the job functions and duties and responsibilities of the claimant had ceased to exist because that is the basis for a redundancy. Further, both of the company's witnesses had also testified that her duties and responsibilities had not ceased to exist and it had only been taken over and absorbed by other departments. This is very commonly done towards employees who, have, uh, who are out of favor with the company. And this is sad to see because the employee might be a good employee, but just because some relationships within the management uh, side and also the employee could have fallen through and therefore such, an, uh, such a happening would occur. The company in this case had also claimed that it had suffered a loss of 10 million at the relevant time. But at the same time, it had purchased a new tech lab, which is pretty inconsistent with what they are claiming in the industrial court. So therefore, based on the evidence before the industrial court, it was also discovered that the claimant was the only employee retrenched. And this does not make sense if you're saying that the company is going through a financial difficulty. It should be at least implemented towards a few departments which cannot only involve the claimant, if I'm not mistaken. The claimant in this case had also not been consulted or informed of the retrenchment exercise. Uh, the claimant was only informed briefly via a text message from one of the company's witness that she was to be terminated due to redundancy. There were no early warnings nor consultations between the company and the claimant, and which goes to show that no fair labor practice was conducted. In the next case of uh, Chan Shayan and uh, Marcus Evans, the claimant in this case was employed as a conference director and had been terminated due to redundancy as a result of a reorganization exercise. However, based on the findings of the court, it had been clear that the job functions and roles had continued to exist. Furthermore, the company had also recruited new conference producers and you can see that the claimant's job functions were being redistributed to new conference producers. When we talk about surplus, uh, it is only when the services of an employee has uh, been reduced or there is any season of the type of work the employee was performing and that is when you can say it's surplus. However, in this case, the company had failed to show how the claimant's portfolio had been reduced. The company had definitely failed to comply with the code of conduct for industrial harmony. Therefore, what is important to note here, if a retrenchment exercise is unavoidable, it is upon the employer to take the measures which are necessary. We understand that the employer needs to minimize the force for the benefit of the company, but paying attention and complying with the guidelines in the code would not harm any anyone. It will only go to show that there is a fair labor practice being practiced in the company. And that could also be the difference between a huge settlement being paid out on the form of back wages and compensation in the industrial court. Many guidelines are set out in the code and they should definitely be considered for fair employment practice. The learned chairman had also in this case stated something which is very important for employers to bear in mind. Employers should bear this in mind as the learned chairman has stated, just as an employer has the right to determine its workforce and strength, so too the employee has the right to be informed of his impending severance of ties with the employer. Sometimes certain employers don't actually know how hard it is for an employee to be notified suddenly that they are being terminated due to redundancy and a retrenchment exercise. They feel that they can just evict the employee 
as of right and without any particular reason so it is important to bear this in mind how important that the a warning or a consultation is towards the employee further to the above in the case of site dermaligum against malayan breweries the federal court themselves have gone on to state that a blatant disregard of the terms agreed in the code would tantamount to perpetration of unfair labor practice or even to connot malafide the courts have acknowledged the existence of the code of conduct and despite being allowed to disregard the code of conduct we in parts with a justification of course a total non adherence to the code of conduct only shows that the employer has not carried out the retrenchment exercise in a proper manner and definitely the absence of fair labor practice is there We move on to the next case which involves Martin Fernandez and others a group of claimants against Club Shalam Slango the learned chairman here in this case had also stated something this that is worth to be remembered by employers especially the right of an employer to reorganize its business must be balanced with the right to a livelihood of an employee we understand that the business of an employer is there yeah, is it's totally up to them to make any decision but when you have hired an employee it is uh, proper to base your reorganization decisions on the together with the rights to a livelihood of an employee because the em- without a happy employee there won't be a happy company as well this principle could also be seen applied in the industrial court case of louis r heng against malayan law journal where it was highlighted that the practice of the court is a reflection of good labor practice and it's a major factor in determining whether the employer acted in a bona fide manner it doesn't cost too much to actually comply with the code of practice but unfortunately there are certain employers who uh, overlook them just because they do not have uh, any legally binding issues there they are not legally binding so and then they result in the employer actually paying out a huge settlement in the industrial court for the claimants who retrench in the case of martin fernandez the claimants were actually longer serving employees compared to the employees who were still in employment with the company the lifeo principle of course was not adhered to by the company this group of seniors who were targeted for salary reduction they were targeted for the their salary had reduced for the amount of in the amount of 1000 to 2000 ringgit malaysia the company had claimed in the industrial court that this salary reduction was across the board to other employees as well however the company the same company could not adduce such evidence before the court the court held that the company did not provide any valid justification for the departure from the lifeo principle again you can see that if the thing that was claimed by the company was actually proved with the proper documents it would be safe to say that the company could have avoided this particular unfair dismissal claim however because they had not conducted it in a proper manner they could not come up with the proper justification for the departure from the lifeo principle the termination was indeed an unfair one we move on to the case then of munusami arumugam uh, whereby they are, the learned chairman had stated that they understand that when the rule is departed from employers can show records of inefficiency unreliability or habitual irregularity Uh, the court the learned chairman also said it's not that they are insisting that full compliance towards the proper acceptable prayer practice is required what they are saying that whenever the rule is departed from the employer should show to the industrial court that there are justifications supported by proper documentations and the burden would undoubtedly be on the employer to prove that In the above case the industrial court had commented that it has to be observed whether or not the claimant's job function have been merely redistributed to the company's existing employees who had commenced employment later than the claimants at the same time the company would also need to adduce evidence that upon redistribution the work rate has improved the company's efficiency in carrying out their daily operations it is understood that uh, the job functions of claimants may be redistributed but at the same time the company would need to show that there is a vast difference uh, in the increase of efficiency in the work rate that is carried out by the subsequent employee to which the work functions were distributed to in this case there were also no prior consultation and no prior warning with regards to the retrenchment exercise the burden of proof is upon the company to prove their justification in not complying with the guidelines in the code of conduct in this case there was no such evidence adduced by the company there is something very important about early consultations between the employee and the employee because they would definitely benefit both parties as you can see there is a belief that an employee would try their best to retain their position by sacrificing certain benefits and the pl- employer at the same time would also be able to recognize those efforts and try their level best to keep the employee in employment with the company as we previously looked at four cases that was decided before the covid era we are now going to look at two cases which was decided actually this year so in this case of joseph lim chenshui against dencom telecommunication the claimant in the above case 
was actually a general manager and he was later on promoted to general manager East Malaysia division of the company. However, the claimant refused to be placed in East Malaysia as there was no much work that warranted a general manager to be placed there to oversee the works. After the claimant's refusal to be placed in East Malaysia, the company, however, slowly started to hire two of senior officers. They were then hired as the head of business development and also a general manager. It was during this point, upon the arrival of the new hirees, that the claimant's job scopes and the responsibilities were taken away from the claimant. Later on, the claimant was informed that the company was undergoing a reorganization exercise and he was to be terminated due to redundancy. There was no information on the selection criteria, how he was selected or whatsoever. The company had merely cited COVID-19 as one of the main reasons for the termination of the claimant. In a retrenchment exercise, the court proceeded to apply the principle applied in Muhammad Noor Hassan against Continental Sime Tire. There are three questions to be answered, actually. And if these three questions are answered in an affirmative way, then the retrenchment would be considered to, be a, to have uh, been carried out in a proper and uh, bona fide manner. So the first question is whether there was a genuine need for the reorganization exercise by the company. So the need for reorganization would only come about if there are some financial difficulties which are preventing the company from moving forward or dragging the company. So that would then a genuine need would arise. So this would be definitely answered in the yes in order for it to be a bona fide exercise. The next one, the next question would be whether a genuine redundancy situation had arise which led to the retrenchment of the claimant. A genuine redundancy situation is one which shows that not only does the claimant's job position title was abolished, but it has to show that the duties are no, do not exist anymore. Companies try to circumvent this by redistributing it, but uh, in the event that it is redistributed, it has to be shown that that particular redistribution actually benefited the company with the proper documents. And the last one, whether the company had complied with the accepted standards and procedure when selecting and retrenching the claimant. You see, there is a fact here that the accepted standards and procedure when selecting and retrenching, you, it, it comes down to the fact that whether there is any compliance with the code of conduct. Because the courts are empowered by virtue of section 30 sub 5a to take into consideration these type of principles. So if the above questions are answered in the affirmative, then the retrenchment exercise would be considered valid and to have been carried out in a bona fide manner. However, this was not the case in the Joseph Lim case. Despite using the COVID-19 pandemic as a reason for the termination of the claimant, during the testimony of the company's witness, the evidence before the court showed more of the company being actually unhappy with the performances of the claimant and not the fact that the claimant services were redundant. The learned chairman had found based on the finding of facts that the COVID-19 pandemic is not sufficient to be used as a reason for a retrenchment exercise as the proper evidence needs to be shown before the industrial court. The learned chairman thereafter held that the claimant's dismissal was indeed without just cause and excuse as even the selection process was not properly disclosed to the court. Therefore, the claimant's termination due to redundancy was definitely not carried out in a bona fide manner. Furthermore, it's clear, it can be clearly seen that the job functions of the claimant still in existence and it was being performed by the employees who were hired after the claimant. The learned chairman also stated that if the actual issue in question is the behavior or the performance of the claimant, there are uh, disciplinary measures or punishments that can be taken, such as warning letters or show cause letters. There are things that can be taken, but trying to offload the employee by way of retrenchment is definitely not something which is uh, uh, proper. It will only lead to the employee challenging the termination and challenging the whole retrenchment exercise. So it's better to go along with it. It has to be said that the decision of the company to seize the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to terminate the claimant from his employment only shows rash and ill-thought exercise by the company. COVID-19 related retrenchment exercise, in fact, are definitely scrutinized in detail and the relevant financial documents have to be shown in order for the exercise to be proper and carried out in a bona fide manner. The reason for this, companies are taking advantage of COVID-19 pandemic in offloading and terminating employees who may be out of favor with the company. As such, the industrial court would definitely require the company to put forth all the proof that is necessary. We look at the last case. This last case is actually quite interesting because uh, in this case of Low Wai Moon against Yulu Packet, the learned chairman, Yang Arif Puan Nur Hayati Binti Hajimat, had decided that the claimant's dismissal was definitely with just cause and excuse as the duties were actually absorbed by another employee and it was based on the LIFO principle. The key takeaway from this case is that although the position was still in existence, the duties had been transferred to a senior employee. The claimant in this case had previously worked for 
for the company from 2005 to 2008, 2011 to 2015, and finally from March 2018 until 31st of May 2019. So there is, a, there is something that should be distinguished over here, whereby even though the claimant might have been in service with the company since 2005, uh, the learned chairman went on to state that each contract has its own specific and separate agreement as each position can validly constitute a separate length of service. Therefore, the LIFO principle here was correctly and properly applied. By taking a look at the, the previously mentioned cases, and the two recently decided cases, it can definitely be seen that courts are not finding fault of the employers you know, just for the fun of it. But a retrenchment exercise which interrupts the livelihood of a claimant should definitely be in detail and not just be done in a rash way, whereby in one, for one day the employer is, employee is needed and the next he can be kicked out. That is not how the industrial court looks at it. Definitely the proper justification and the documentation is needed. As such, my advice is that uh, when a reorganizing exercise is carried out and an employee loses his job as a result of it, it would only be fair labor practice when it is shown that an employer has taken all the reasonable, reasonable is not all precautions, but the reasonable precautions is by looking into the accepted practice in the code of conduct, which is in order to try and save the particular employee who in fact has been a part of the operations of the company prior to the employee's termination. So with that, I'll pass the floor over to Chian. Thank you for listening to my slides today. Thanks, Navin, and thanks, Jasmine, for the for the insight. We will now move on to uh, Q and A. Uh, I think Navin, you can stop sharing. The oh, screen. All right. Now moving on to the Q and A session. The question that we have here is maybe I'll start with this first. If I was unfairly dismissed in back in 2015, can I still go after the case? Uh, Navin, do you want to take this question? Yeah, I can take it. If you were unfairly dismissed in 2015, unfortunately, there is a time limit with regards to bringing a case of unfair dismissal, which is uh, 60 days from uh, the date of your termination. So the un un unless you can provide a proper justification to the Director General of Industrial Relations, the DGIR. However, when it comes to the delay after 60 days, the, the DGIR is quite strict towards that. So it, uh, you, you won't be able to pursue your claim if it's in 2015. Right. Thanks, Navin. Move on to the next one. Please explain temporary layoff. How long is deemed temporary? What if employees refuse to sign acceptance on pay cut? Can the employer proceed with the retrenchment exercise since it could not implement a pay cut exercise to sustain its business? Jasmine, do you want to take this? Thank you, Chian. Now, this is a very interesting question, um, which we commonly get as well. Temporary layoff, is, it usually happens when the employer fails to give any work or pay un, uh, for at least 12, if I'm not mistaken, 12 working days within four weeks in a row. This is uh, provided for in the regulations 1980, actually. And if the employee refused to sign the acceptance on the pay cut and the employee proceeds with the pay cut, eventually, uh, what the employee can do is to lodge a complaint with the labor department. And another option is that the employee may have a claim for constructive dismissal because at the end of the day, salary amounts to a fundamental breach or rather non-payment of salary amounts to a fundamental breach of the employment contract. And if the employee, if, with the next part of the question, if the employee refuse to accept the pay cut and the employer has no choice but to proceed with the retrenchment exercise, again, it goes to show what kind, whether or not the retrenchment exercise can be justified in court. Suppose perhaps the, uh, the employer has already taken several measures of other cost-cutting measures, not just the pay cut issue, but other aspects as well, which we have covered earlier. So the employer can inform or rather can show this kind of proof to the industrial court and say that, look, I have taken this and that measure in order to avoid the retrenchment exercise. But at the end of the day, to ensure business sustainability, we have no choice but to uh, go through with the pay cut exercise and go through with the retrenchment uh, exercise as well. So as long as the employer is able to justify the retrenchment, it will usually hold up in court. Thanks, Jasmine. I'll move on to the next one. How do we determine day of termination? Is it based on termination letters date 
or last day of service? Navin, you want to take this? I'll take this. Uh, for the day of termination, if you look at your termination letter, it will be stated there your last day of service. So that would be, it would be 60 days. I mean, to, uh, with regards to the previous question that I answered, uh, whether you can bring in, a, uh, whether there is any limitation as to time to bring your claim, it will be 60 days from your last day of service. Uh, sorry if I wasn't clear for the earlier uh, the earlier question. So you look at the termination letter, then the last day of service will be slated. It follows not the termination letter's date, but it follows your last day of service. All right, thanks, Navin. I'm moving on to the next question. I would like to know if companies are compelled and in other words, must fully comply with the code of conduct. For example, by having consultation sessions with the employees. If yes, what would be your view on how the consultation should be conducted, especially at this pandemic? where most of the employees are working from home. Uh, just me, you want to take this? Thanks, Jen. Well, we have seen various modes of communication throughout this MCO and the pandemic as well. Employers have actually uh, commenced virtual consultation and discussion and open dialogues over um, various platforms, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Google Meet. So all of this would suffice as long as the employees are communicated, uh, are informed of what the employers intend to do. And we have seen also from the earlier cases as well that although the code of conduct is a guideline, which is a good guideline as well, and the courts usually refer to it, but if ever the employer feels the need to depart from several guidelines as stated in the code of conduct, as long as the employer can justify its decision, then uh, that would the court will also take that into consideration and may not always penalize the employer for not complying with the code of conduct. Thanks, Jasmine. Next one. Any risks to dismissing an employer during probation? Arvin, you want to take this? Yeah, I'll take this. Um, okay, when you look at an employee, whether the employee is under probation or whether he's confirmed, they enjoy the same rights. This has been already discussed in many cases that have been decided as well. But the thing about a probation, when you're in a probation period, if let's say you have given the employee a probation period of three months or six months, you have to allow the employee to complete his probation in order to give you a fair assessment whether he's completed the probation properly and to allow to afford him the chance to be confirmed. So when you dismiss an employee during probation, especially prematurely before his probation period ends, you have to give sufficient evidence that in fact you have assessed his performance. But if you dismiss the employee before the period ends, it's hard for you to assess the performance before you uh, before the six month ends. So the courts will definitely ask a question. If you have given six months, why do you terminate in three months? So then you, the company needs to prepare the answers properly with the proper documentation in regards to the performance or misconduct or whatever. So there are risks if you don't have the proper the explanations uh, for the termination of an em- employee during probation. All right. Thanks, Navin. Uh, I think this, the next question is also related to what, what you were yeah. uh, talking about. The, okay, so just let me read out the question first. Uh, Joseph Lim case, since you refer- feels to be placed in East Malaysia will affect the company and what can the company do? Okay, for the Joseph Lim case, he was a general manager in the uh, Peninsula Malaysia. Later on, he was uh, <coughs> asked to become the general manager of East Malaysia. However, this was a division that was uh, just budding and uh, it wasn't fully developed yet. And furthermore, there was no work there for a permanent general manager to be placed there. Joseph Lim was actually from the Peninsula Malaysia and for him to transfer over there would not seem correct. And also under his contract if there is no term for transfer it would be hard as well Uh, in his contract i believe there was no terms that allowed him to go for a transfer permanently so that is why the company could not explain the work so even he fell out of favor that's when the company started taking actions like redistributing his work you can find this very common when the company when the employee goes against the wishes of the company so for what the company can do uh, they can actually hire someone else to go over there but you can't just remove uh, joseph a person like joseph lim from your company so you have to learn to balance out both the employees in question. So if you have a general manager for Peninsula, find a general manager for East Malaysia who probably originates from there, which is easier. And when you can get him to report down back to you, it's better as that. But not to terminate an employee just because he doesn't want to go to East Malaysia. Thanks, Navin. Moving on to the next one from Fiza. I just resigned 27th of August 2021, probably under the nature of constructive dismissal. I can still report this to IR, right? Within 60 days. Uh, Jasmine, you want to take this? 
Yes, as long as it is within 60 days from the date of your last working day, then you have the, you have the opportunity to file that representation to the nearest labour department. Thanks, uh, Jasmine. I am told that there are also some questions in the chat, so maybe I'll take some questions from the chat. Okay, there is this one question which says that is it proper for employer to release full termination benefits after 60 days to avoid employee lodge case against employer? Navin or maybe Jasmine, do you want to take this? I, I can take it. Uh, is it proper for employer to release full termination benefits after 60 days to avoid employee lodge case against employer? I would have to say that this is definitely not uh, something very fair towards the employee. So it's not proper to release only after 60 days because they are, they are you have to give them the due respect for the services they have put in towards your company. So if you are thinking of uh, treating your employee as such, um, it wouldn't be fair towards the employee. If you have already decided and you have the proper documents and you have complied with the accepted practice, just release the full termination benefits because it's not going to harm anyone. Even if the employee decides to go to the industrial, go to the industrial relations department and goes for a case in the industrial court, if you have the sufficient and proper proof, there's nothing for you to worry. In fact, releasing the termination benefits as soon as possible actually repairs your case and fixes your case and tilts the case towards your side. So that would be my advice for that particular situation. Thank you. Thanks, Navin. Um, move on to, there's a quite a lot of questions. Maybe we'll just take uh, two or three more. The, there's this one from anonymous and lead as a under the code of conduct for industrial harmony one of the few factors to consider our age and family background which age group and type of family background is considered critical for entrenchment consideration jasmine you want to take this now when i mentioned the age uh, this would actually refer to those who have exceeded the minimum retirement age so you will pay uh, more attention to those who are actually uh, 70 years old, but still continue working with the employee, uh, sorry, continue work, work, working with the employer. So these are the examples of the age. Uh, and, and family background, it will also include positions such as whether or not this person is a, a citizen or foreign foreigner. So this kind of various aspect, um, we need to prioritize as stated in the code of conduct. If the person is a permanent employee, is a citizen, then they would usually uh, not be selected will not be selected first. Uh, all right. Thanks, uh, Jasmine. There is another, another, okay, there is a question uh, from Andrew, which asks that um, since legal fees are charged for cases pursued either in industrial court and civil court, isn't it more effective to go to civil court? Navin, can you take this? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, when it comes to an unfair dismissal case, uh, which we are dealing today with the topic of the day, the the civil courts have no power to hear the matter because it's provided for in the Industrial Relations Act. The Industrial Relations Act is an act to promote industrial harmony. And they have clearly set out the the in uh, the sections in the Industrial Relations Act that the matter is to be heard under a statutory body under the Human Resource Ministry, which is the Industrial Court. There is something that needs to be uh, distinguished here. If you go to a civil court, uh, being for an employee, you have uh, to deal not only with the legal fees for the lawyer, but also the cost that will be awarded in the event the employee loses. But if you look at the industrial court, the costs would not be awarded even if the employee loses. So that is a, one of the ma main factors why employees are given the statutory instrument, which is the industrial court. They don't have to pay for filing. There is no fees involved in filing. And also there is no fees involved for costs. And that is very important because cases can drag on. And when the employer has not found work, it will be more difficult to pay costs at the end of a matter where they have already lost their job and further they have to pay costs to the company that has terminated them. The companies are definitely, with the company that is with them, but I'm worried more for the employees here. So it's better to be in the industrial court, if you ask me, la, my own view on that. Thanks, Navin. I think uh, it's already four. I'm going to take the last two questions. Uh, I know there are a lot of questions here. Um, but it's so out of time, but um, we just take two more questions, okay? There's this question um, she asked that, when can you file a statement of case in the industrial court? Maybe Jasmine, you want to take this? Uh, okay, what usually happens after you file the representation form at the in, uh, at the labor department? Uh, previously, the minister will need to will need to go through the documents and then he has the discretion to see whether or not he wants to refer your case to the industrial court. And that is, uh, but but ever since the amendment came into effect, the representation cases will automatically be sent 
to the industrial court. Of course, after um, you have one or two rounds of reconciliation meeting. So when the matter is actually lodged in the in the industrial court already, there would be a case number given to you. Uh, there would be a mention date as well. And it is during these mentioned dates that the courts will give you directions on when the, the claimant, the employee, can file the statement of case. So usually you'll be given two weeks or if for various circumstances that you require additional time, you may be given one month to fall in a statement of case, a statement of case as well. And then there will be several mentioned dates fixed subsequently where the company will be given the same opportunity to file in their statement in reply. So it goes on. It um, There is no fixed timing to file the statement of case and it all depends on the direction that will be given by the court. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, maybe I'll just take one last question. How about non-payment of non uh, sorry non-payment of monthly sales commission, can it be considered as a constructive dismissal approach? Navin, you want to take this? Okay. okay. Can it be considered as a constructive dismissal approach? When we talk about constructive dismissal, it, uh, it is definitely described as a fundamental breach which goes to the root of the contract of employment. So when you talk about uh, monthly sales commission, we have to look at the contract as in how does it specify this monthly sales commission? How is it to be paid? Does it, is it to be paid monthly? Is it to be paid yearly? or every three months, every six months. These are all important terms and I can only give the proper answer after, upon looking of, at the contract of employment. But just to be safe, if it is stated that the sales commission and the pro proper scale of it is to be paid over a period of month, over a period of time, or even one uh, every uh, on a monthly basis, it can be considered as a constructive dismissal approach. However, for this approach to actually work, for, for you to be considered as constructively dismissed, it's always proper for you to put in an email or a letter or a query to clarify with regards to this particular situation. Even in any, whether it's payment of salary or removal of particular laptops or anything, just send an email just to be safe. And in the event that no one clarifies with you or gives you the proper explanation, then you can go on to uh, reply or send a letter to say that you have been constructively dismissed because it is a breach, a fundamental breach to the contract of uh, employment. Thanks to uh, Jasmine and Navin for the insights. I'm so sorry that we cannot attend to all the questions that you all have posted. Let me just share my screen. Okay, before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. First, please join us again for our upcoming talks. We have two talks here. You can see the slide. The first one would be on the 22nd of September. Uh, the topic will be resolving disputes in administration of estates. This will be handled by uh, our associates, Priscilla and Carmen. And the next one will be on the 6th of October. The topic will be what can go wrong in a sale and purchase agreement for property. Uh, the, the, our speakers will be our partner, uh, Ms. Sarah Kambali, and also our associate, uh, Mr. Marcus Leong. Secondly, please fill up our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk. The link to the form will be posted in the chat box as well. And thirdly, do follow our social media accounts. Uh, we have listed here all, all our social media accounts. And fourthly, if you would like to speak to our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the phone or over video conference. Please fill in the form on our website and the link is also posted in our chat box. To our guests, thank, thank you for joining us. We hope you found today's session informative and useful. Thank you, everyone, and see you at our next talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.